Good morning. Uh, I'm Kristen Sullivan. I'm with Vision and Security, and I actually work on application security practice. I'm not here to talk about application security. I'm actually here to talk about women in IT security. Now, why? Well, I've been in application security for about 10 years now, and the industry has completely changed from where we were 10 years ago. I would go to conferences, and everybody was talking and saying kind of the same thing, that security was a requirement. People were coming to us when they had to. They were coming to us when they had to meet compliance or pass an audit, but they weren't coming to us voluntarily. Identity theft wasn't exactly a household name or a household term, and that's really changed. You can't open a newspaper without seeing an article about IT security, cyber warfare, hackers, all of those kinds of things. So what has that done to our job market? Well, we have a tremendous amount of jobs and not enough people to fill them. That tells me that we have to be better mentors, and we have to encourage more people to come into our field. And we have to figure out why there are so few women in IT security. I mean, we look at, and there's been a general conversation happening. Cheryl Sandberg came out with Lean In, but it's much more of a general conversation about women entering into the skills with science, technology, and math. But with IT security, at least in my experience, there are far fewer women in this space. So we have to figure out why and do things differently and maybe have a better understanding. And that's why I put this talk together. Make sure. Okay. I have a couple of disclaimers. For one thing, there's a couple other reasons that I wanted to do this talk. When people find out what I do for a living, they get very curious. I get a lot of questions from people from all walks of life, all different ages. And so I wanted to bring that to a more broader audience. Um, the other thing was, I got two pieces of feedback when I started putting this talk together, talk about putting this talk together. And those two pieces of feedback made me even more determined to make this talk into fruition. The first was, I'm going to be talking to an empty room because there are no women in security. The second was, women only really want to work in sales. They don't want to become technical. They can make better money in sales. And to me, that's not a gender-based issue. It's a career path issue. It's maybe some people are interested in the economics of this, what sales can do for you. The other, sorry, I'm new to this clicker. <laughs> uh, the other disclaimer I have is I don't want this to be a politically charged talk. This is really about becoming better mentors. It's really about trying to figure out what we need to do in our industry. I have to make generalizations, and I have to make sweeping statements. That doesn't mean that all the things that I'm going to say apply to men versus women. But generally speaking, the research showed that they do. They are generalizations. Uh, the other thing is, I'm not on my soapbox. I'm not speaking from my own opinion. All of what I say today comes out of research I've done. And that research stems from people in IT security, people in business, business leaders, authors, and even a psychologist. You'll see quotes kind of smattered throughout this talk. I'm not going to touch on them. I just included them so that you would kind of know my mindset as I was doing my research and the things that resonated with me. Okay, so, oops. Anybody know who this is or why I would incorporate her in this? Okay. Her name is Ada Lovelace, and she's actually arguably considered the very first programmer. And I know you're looking at this portrait thinking, this woman lived a really long time ago. How can she be the first programmer? Well, she's considered the first programmer because she wrote this algorithm. This algorithm is the very first algorithm meant to be executed by a machine. And People will argue that she's not the very first programmer because the machine itself never came to fruition. But her notes, this algorithm, were considered so very important, they were published 100 years later in the 1950s. So they did have a big impact. And it's apropos that we talk about Ada Lovelace today because later this month there is Ada Lovelace Day. It's a day to celebrate the women who work in the science, math, and technology fields. I'm just not going to get this right. <laughs> so I'm going to start talking about weaknesses. We have to figure out what the detractors are for women, rumors and myths about maybe how our industry looks from an outsider's perspective. And we're going to have to talk about weaknesses. How women can maybe be a little bit weaker in a male-dominated space. 
These are things I'm going to tell stories on myself, okay? Uh, and again, there are generalizations being made. So rumors and myths. There is a, uh, actually I want to go back for a second because, oops, I'm going the wrong way. I had a slide, oh, <laughs> this thing is not as long. Uh, excuse me. I wanted to touch on this slide real quick. These are the top 10 women in the IT security space, and eWeek decided on that. I will be honest with you. There are names on this list that I did not know. Um, and it, 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 I looked them up. They're all very important people, and they're, they've arranged the spectrum of the IT security space. So if you don't know them, you should. A lot of the opinions that are in this talk come out of their mouths. Okay, so I did that. So rumors and this. Back to that. This is one of those concepts that came out of those women's mouths. Um, that when security and the IT security space is portrayed by the media as a very kind of dark underworld that we all work in, you know, you hear about Russian hackers, and you hear about the Chinese hackers, and you hear about anonymous and hacktivism. And it seems like a very dark place. That makes sense to me. But I think we need to get the message out there that for the most part, the majority of us are just highly curious people who like to break stuff, right? There are exceptions to that. If you want to chase the cyber criminals, if you want to do that, there are those options as well. I had a very good friend of mine who used to work at the state police in the forensics unit. She handled the child pornography cases. We were sitting at lunch one day and, you know, just talking shop. And I looked at her and I said, I just don't know how you do what you do. She said that the images are no more disturbing for me than they were for my male counterparts because they're just simply disturbing. I had another friend that worked for the Secret Service in the Cyber Crimes Unit. I remember calling her on her cell one day. She's like, can I call you back? I'm in the middle of an interrogation. Yeah, I, whatever I had to say to you was not that important. But that's not my daily life. And I think for most people in security, it's not our daily life. And we need to encourage people that if you don't want to have to work in that piece of our industry, you really don't have to. We have all been trained that if we're in an engagement, doing an assessment, and we come across some of that material, like say child pornography, we have been trained on how to respond. But I've been doing this for 10 years, and knock on wood, I haven't had one of those days. And I hope I never do. The other thing that was, that was mentioned in the research is that people don't think that hacking is ladylike. Uh, I don't have a comment where that's concerned, but I thought it was interesting, so I wanted to incorporate it. Gavin to Becker, if you don't know who he is, he wrote a very good book called The Gift of Fear. And like I say, it's, it's an incredible book, but there were some big takeaways from it. And one of the things, um, part of what he does, just to give you an idea of who he is, he's got a very extensive resume. But he basically provides security for high profile individuals who are either being stopped or having their uh, life threatened. And what he does in this book, I got to this one part towards the end, and I was so interested that I started highlighting all over the place. And I even, my mother's like the biggest word board on the planet. So I started typing up quotes out of this book for her. And it's something, he teaches such a good, he says it so well, that it was one of those things where every time I start worrying, I think back to this man. But he defines the difference between fear and worry. Those are two things that I didn't think were very far apart as far as the concept, but I hadn't really ever thought about it. What he argues is that fear is an instinct. We share it with a lot of the animal kingdom. It's not something unique to human beings. And the reason we experience fear is as a survival mechanism. It is a way for us to have a little bit more time to react, to be able to protect ourselves in a potentially dangerous situation. But then he talks about worry. And he argues that no other animal in the animal kingdom worries. Worry is something that human beings have self-manifested. And it does nothing but create negativity. It takes time off of our lives. It is a waste of our time. And it's really a distractor for true problem solving. Because if you think about it, when you're worrying about something, you're not solving the problem. You're merely blowing it out of proportion or stewing on it. But you're absolutely not doing anything worthwhile when you worry. And across all of the research, not to say that there aren't male worry works out there, women tend to worry more than men. So how does this relate back to IT security? 
I got to think about how it's related to me, and I'll tell you a story. There's a guy on my team. He and I got approval to start Python training exactly at the same time. I don't know if you've all heard of a tool called Rash, but some other guys on the team wrote this tool to a mobile application assessments. It's written in Python. Every once in a while, they'll ask for people to volunteer to, you know, write maintenance, do maintenance, or write enhancements, or whatnot. So we're on a team call one day, and the guy said, like, hey, we need somebody to help us out with some Python stuff. My male counterpart immediately raised his hand. Never thought about it. I sat there, and I was going, hmm, I worry. I'm wondering if uh, I have the right skill set. I'm wondering if I've learned enough. What if I make a stupid statement, ask a stupid question? And will I be successful at this task? So we're going to come back to that a little bit later. The other thing, and this sort of takes me back to my very first interview with the guy that gave me the very first shot in my first job in technology as a developer. I think people coming into our industry worry that there's so much to know that they can't know at all. And what he said to me all those years ago, and it's carried with me ever since, is that the longer you're in this industry, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. There's too much out there to know. So it's something that we all experience, but I think that may be a detractor for some people coming into this industry. We'll come back to that as well. So imposter syndrome, overwhelmingly, across all the research, women suffer more from imposter syndrome than men. What's imposter syndrome? Imposter syndrome is the idea that I haven't really achieved my own successes. I got lucky, I was in the right place at the right time, I knew somebody, and networked well. The guy that was going to vote against me was out sick that day. Okay? Imposter syndrome, Warren Buffett actually, when he was being interviewed about women in male dominated spaces, he told a story. And he didn't call it imposter syndrome, but it's exactly what he described. He talked about a friend of his. He didn't name names, I don't believe, but this, is, this friend of his, he said, she's overwhelmingly intelligent, overwhelmingly successful. She's incredible. She even won a Pulitzer Prize, but she never believed that she deserved it. I don't think that anybody wins a Pulitzer Prize without deserving it. Another example, Betty White. Every time she gets nominated for an award, she looks at her fellow nominees and decides that she cannot win. So she's never prepared with an acceptance speech, though she's won multiple times. So again, I'll tell a story of myself. When I got hired on the business, I was being hired onto a team of very elite people who I had a lot of respect for. One I had even seen years ago speak at this conference. He spoke on five continents. He is one of the decision makers of the talks that make it to Black Hat USA. This was the team of people that I was joining. I couldn't believe it. I absolutely, it never occurred to me at that point in my life that they saw something in me, that I had something to bring to the table. So I get on my first team call and I'm supposed to introduce myself. And basically the way I came across is, you all are gods, I'm a minion, and I'm willing to get down on my knees and kiss your ring. <coughs> As soon as I hit the mute button, I wanted to bang my head against the wall. I knew exactly what I had done. I knew exactly how it sounded. And I knew that I sounded like a bad hire. Well, it's been three years later. I think it's okay. I've proven myself. But I really sandbagged myself that day, and there was nothing I could do. So where does this all come from? This is where we get down to the psychology. There's a woman who actually has a PhD in psychology, wrote a book about how we achieve our goals. An excerpt of that book was published in Psychology Today, and that's the part we're going to talk about. Her, what her research says is that this all goes back to fifth grade. What we, we send two different messages to fifth grade boys versus fifth grade girls. And they both sound very positive and face value. We, but little boys, fifth graders, who are bright, have a very short attention span. They move around a lot. They're always on the go. And what we're telling them is, if you can just listen for five more minutes, if you can just sit still a little longer, you can just push a little farther, you'll make it. Whereas the fifth grade girls sitting there very poised and focused and locked in on a, on a task at hand, we're saying, congratulations, job well done, you succeeded. Great deal on the A. 
These two things, like I say, sound very, very positive at face value. But what we're telling the boys is, you don't have any limitations. You have no ceiling. We're telling the girls, you succeeded, past tense. So I'm going to go back to that Python example. Because I related this back to my own life. My male counterpart, who volunteered immediately for that opportunity that I lost because I was worrying about it, he never once thought the same things that I was thinking. Do you have a big enough skill set? Have I learned enough Python? I guarantee you, he didn't have time to think because he reacted so quickly. But I guarantee you, if I asked him today, what were you thinking? Well, I've, I've written, you know, code in other languages. I have the right skill set. I have some training. And I have a whole bunch of people on this team who have a lot more Python experience than I do. I have the support. I can go to them for help. Whereas I was like, have I learned enough? Have I gotten there? And I think we need to really, as mentors, employers, community leaders, encourage young girls to, to being vulnerable, putting yourself out there, looking stupid, failing, that's okay. In fact, that's encouraged. Because my coworker thought, if I just push a little harder, if I just look at it a little longer, I'll figure it out. And that's so important. Look at Steve Jobs. He'll go down in history as one of the best technologists in, in the universe, right? But how many times did he fail on a very public level? So whether you agree with her theory or not, it's very compelling and very interesting. So we can't have this conversation without at least touching on the concepts of lean in. Don't lean away from the conversation, the table, the opportunity. Because as soon as you do, it's gone. So we've talked about the weaknesses, we've talked about the negative side. Now I want to focus on the positive side. Women have a, a great many talents to bring to the table in the IT security space. What am I talking about? Well, I don't think that there is anyone in our field whose major prerogative in life isn't to go to somebody, whether it be an internal customer or a client, and say, your baby's ugly. In a way that they'll say, thank you so much. When can we hire you? We want to have you back. We want you to do more work. We're in a very unique, you know, situation in a way. And I have never seen an IT security job description that doesn't include great communication skills. Communication skills are so important because we have to have the gift of gab. We have to be good listeners. But we also have to be nurtured. And these are, are traits that a lot of women share. We have to be good talkers because we have to talk not just to the guy who's, who never looks up from the keyboard. We have to be able to go into the boardroom and talk to that C-level and executive. And we have to talk to everyone in between. It means we have to speak different languages to different recipients of that information. We also have to be very good listeners because we're going to have a lot of people that say, oh, no, my baby's perfect, you're wrong. And we have to listen to their concerns. We have to understand and be able to either retell the information, explain better or differently, but we have to get a point across. And that's really important. The other thing, as far as the nurturing, we have to create change. We want people to change how they do whatever it is that they're doing not right. And to do that, we can't shove security down anybody's throat. It doesn't work. Security does two things to any project. It has time and money. And I haven't ever seen a project that has enough time or money. So if we do it in a nurturing way that inspires a cultural change, and we really get these people that we work with to understand that we're not there as adversaries. We're there as team members to help them make their product more robust and better, whatever that product may be. We have to be able to do that. It's imperative because all we're going to do if we start trying to shove security down somebody's throat is get circumvented, and it defeats their entire purpose for us being here. So the other thing, this came out of the mouths of one of the top 10 women in security that I thought was really interesting about women having a natural affinity towards security. Because we are taught how to protect ourselves a little bit more than our male counterparts, depending on where you grew up. 
And to that point, like, there is no woman that's been on a physical college campus that hasn't been sat down when they came in as incoming students and was told how to get across campus and find it. Where the emergency phones or domes are if you're, you know, being attacked. You know, most women have been taught when they start driving, if you have to park in a parking garage, have your keys in your hand so you're not fumbling around in the darkness by your car in your purse, you know. So I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. Women naturally look for the vulnerabilities in our environment. So we, we started talking about one of those tractors being that our industry looks like a dark, kind of creepy place. So I think one of the other things that women may not know, other people may not know about our, interesting, or our, our industry, is that we have one of the most educationally rich environments I've ever seen in my life. If, how many people can say they work in an industry where criminals sit next to federal agents at the same conferences, use the same tools, and learn from the same people how to do their job? The information is out there, and it's kind of going back to that, I'm afraid of worried about knowing, not knowing enough. In our industry, there's a tool, there's a blog, there's a YouTube video, there's a book, there's something, there's a class. And, you know, even the most anti-social guy in our industry who's written something or researched something, done a talk, I guarantee you can dig up his email and you'll find more out about whatever that was than you ever wanted to know because that is what I'm talking about. People love to talk in this industry. We love to teach each other. So I think that's an important thing that we need to expose about our, our, our industry. So I talked about, uh, actually, I, I, I think I didn't, but I was at ASIC USA last year in New York City, and they went around to all the vendor booths, and they were going to hand you a yellow balloon if you were hiring. The place was a sea of yellow balloon, yellow, yellow balloons. And then it hasn't changed. Last week I was at DerbyCon and I talked to friends that work for the competing companies against Fishnet. We all said the same thing. Everybody's hiring. I had one guy go, you know anybody good? I know if you do, you're probably trying to hire them. So again, you have to be better mentors to get more people into your industry. And I wanted to talk about the face of tomorrow. It is starting to change. At AppSec USA last year, I was going to the talks and I was there to recruit. So I was really paying attention to who the attendees were, what they do for a living, what their skill sets were. I didn't see many women my age in those talks, or just a handful, but there was a group of girls who were coming out of four-year degree programs and master's programs at local universities in New York City looking for internships. So it was very encouraging. So I wanted to end on a really good example of Actually, my very first mentor in this business, if you don't know who's up on the screen, it's Kevin Johnson. I started, he, he wrote the very first application security courses for SANS, and I went to his first certification course down in Atlanta, and that's when I met him. That was many years ago. I've actually been certified in two of his courses. Uh, and he, he, he's, he tells these stories, if you know him, or if you've been sat through his talks, but after a few of them, you feel like you've started to know his family because he incorporates them in everything that he does. So, like I say, he's my very first mentor and he's since become a really good friend through the years. And he was telling me the story at DerbyCon a couple of years ago, as he, he's a great storyteller. And I said, I called him when I was putting this presentation together. I said, Kevin, can I use that story that you told? And can I post pictures in my presentation of you and Brennan? He said, oh yeah, that'd, that'd be great. So he would, he traveled so much, and when he was teaching SANS courses, he really wanted his family to come with him as much as possible. So on one of those trips, they get to the hotel the night before, he sets up the classroom, and the next morning he gets up, he gets ready, he comes out, and Brent is dressed and ready to go. He goes, Brent, what's up? She goes, I'm ready to teach. She had helped him set up the classroom. So she figured once she helped him set up the classroom, she was also going to help him teach. And this is what's so important about this. He did not want to say no. So he's a really quick thinker on his feet, and he said, you'll have to wait till you're older. Such an important thing to say. He didn't want to discourage her in any way. So time passes, they're in another city, and 
She helps him set up a classroom. Next morning, she pops up, she's ready to go. And he's the friend, what's up? She goes, I'm older now. And so he, he didn't want to say no again. So what he did is he went to a major conference, convinced the coordinators to let him co-present with his daughter, Brenna. These are pictures from one of those events. And she did it. She absolutely got up there with her dad, and they gave a presentation on kids' mobile apps and data security privacy issues around that, those apps. And she was really successful, and she's, she's like gone home. This is our future. And if we can be mentors like Kevin, as parents, community leaders, employers, just peak role models, we will have a really rich industry of up-and-coming security professionals. So, I, like I said, I just wanted to end with the future, where we're going, and uh, thank you so much. I have a page of references, and I have my contact information. Does anybody have questions, comments? Well, thank you for having me.